Did I hear someone say yoo-hoo? That is awesome. Oh. Put me in the right frame of mind. My name is Eduardo. I'm an alcoholic. Best seat in the house, I swear to you. Honestly, it's wonderful to see your faces. I hope you don't mind that I took my mask off. It just fogs this thing up. I have been vaccinated. If anyone feels uncomfortable, please raise your hand and let me know because I have no problem putting it on again just for everyone's sake. Okay, so I'm an alcoholic. I have been, I am qualified to speak. Having been through this process with a loving God, as I found expressed, in these meetings and people like you and a, uh, a sponsor who has a sponsor and I also sponsor people. Um, I'm almost finished making all my amends. I made a, a big financial one um, this past uh, week and I, I'm walking on air today. I'm having one of those green lights kind of all the way days and weeks. Uh, and I do try to work the latter steps and all the steps on a daily basis, especially the latter ones, to the best of my ability and willingness on a daily basis. I want to thank you in advance for your kind attention. I know that there's a difference between um, hearing and listening. And the time that you're giving me here matters a lot to me because it reminds me that I'm not alone. And I do get emotional sometimes, and if you have trouble with that, eh. Well, good luck. I don't. I don't at all. Um, uh, I want to thank everyone for their service and again for giving me this opportunity. Uh, gosh, so how do I briefly qualify? Um, what, uh, 14, 15 pages in this chapter, you know, so I really want to get to it. So I will briefly qualify just by saying if you want to know my story, reread pages 21 and 22, you know? I've been puzzling you, I have this lack of proportion, I don't have the memory, you know, like, well, if that was enough, why don't I stop? Because I couldn't. Um, and uh, I placed myself beyond, beyond human aid. My own will, I couldn't stop, and I didn't know that I had this problem. I didn't know what the problem was. So imagine my joy when I came into AA, court order, not willingly. God bless you if you came because you recognized that you had a problem and were trying to do something about it. I fought this tooth and nail. This chapter speaks to me and I think, you know, I'm a big fan of Bill Wilson when he wrote We Agnostics. I mean, that talking about the spiritual experience, whatever that means to you, whatever higher power, God, universal spirit, creative mind, whatever that means to you, you know, I think he did a masterful job. I mean, that chapter has been vetted by all religions, mystics, spiritual people, no problem with it. But over time, as I've been reading this chapter, I have got a tremendous respect for what he wrote here. He walks the line, you know, between talking to the people that were at the foundation of this program, the Oxford groupers and very, very religious, very, you know, fundamental Christians. And then also the new emerging, you know, um, character of Alcoholics Anonymous and the characteristics of alcoholics who were resistant to anything that you called God. And he does a masterful job of speaking to them, but also the first part of this chapter is talking both to the alcoholic and the family members of alcoholics. And there's this thing that happens in psychiatry or in sales where you triangulate something. It's not me pointing the finger at you and saying, you've got a problem. It's we alcoholics, we're on the same side of the table and we're looking at something. And then the family member can feel that, yes, we're looking at something and we're hearing something here. And these chapters talk about that. And there are some anchor things that, you know, are mentioned and I will kind of touch on some of them. There is so much in here. I mean, we could spend hours and hours and, well, let me start that. Um, and I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> but I do love this chapter. And 
you know, of course it starts with we, it's very inclusive, here we are, there is no judgment, you know. It talks about, um, you know, this metaphor that he uses about the ship, you know. And whether that's a metaphor for the collective, and we had a crash and sank, or whether you look at it as the individual crashed, the idea is, is that in both cases, however you look at it, there's survival here. And I am blessed, and I have come to look at this as a blessing that despite my alcoholism and my problem that I did not know, and the problems that I had as a result of it, I have survived. And I get very sad when I think of those who haven't survived. And so I have a responsibility to say, well, if I have survived this tragic thing, what am I going to do with it? And I think that's what this chapter is talking about. Do not focus on the problem. Focus on the solution, which is why I appreciate Big Book Step Study and solution-based meetings, because we talk about the solution. In this chapter, there's a lot of mentioning about things like facts and miracles and yet tragedies. And th there's, there's, actually, I mean, there's actually like a little bit of humor and tremendous sadness when we talk about Dr. Jung and how he approached Roland and Hazard, that, that businessman. I'll, I'll get to that hopefully if I have the time because I see it both ways. So, um, in... It, on page 18, it talks about, after we've talked about uh, the, uh, the person who has been affected, the family member, the friend, and I heard a statistic once that an alcoholic, and I'm speaking for myself as well, we affect at least 10 people in our lives. 10 people in our immediate circle, let alone you know, the people outside of that circle. So, where is, you know, the joy in that? You know, there isn't. But, when we talk to another alcoholic, and it says so on page 18, that here, as a result of this, we are carrying ourselves, our whole deportment shouts at the new prospect that there is a solution. So, this is joy in this chapter because that's what I was looking for. I, I was joyless, I was depressed, I was suicidal, and I was clueless. And because of all of that stuff that was going on in my head, it was a very dark time in my life. But when I read, you know, that we have solved the drink problem, well, you've got my attention. And you get my attention when I come into rooms like this and I hear my story and I hear that despite the tragedy that I have made and the way that I feel that there is hope. And so, what is the miracle here? Well, let's just start with the fact that I survived and I haven't had a drink today. And I think that small miracle, I think God, my, the, my understanding of a higher power God, if you allow me, I'm going to say God, uh, celebrates the small. And because as an alcoholic, I tend to minimize things. Well, you know, I'm not that bad in all of this stuff. And it's a big deal. And I, uh, my, my sober date is January 4th, 1985. And I am still humbled and grateful that I have survived. And I have a responsibility when I come and I share among you to say that people helped me. And if you get anything from what I say, it's that there is a solution and there is hope. No matter how badly you may have felt, today is a new day. What are we going to do with it? And that's the metaphor of the shipwreck. What am I going to do in this day? Having survived, what am I going to do going forward? And uh, it says on page 20, you know, like, what do I have to do? You know, like, what do I have to do? Not think, but what do I have to do? 
And there are six pages in this chapter that talk about the problem before it even gets into talking about, well, we're going to mention the solution and what it is and what you have to do, but we're going to have to also explain this obstacle, this thing that got in my way of getting the solution that you presented. I mean, think of it. I came into AA, okay, court order, but once I had decided that I needed help and I wanted help, you started mentioning this spiritual solution and I was like, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? You mean that? That thing that I, th I mean like I thought I'd burn that bridge? Who am I to go back and ask a power greater than myself whether it's other people? Because even that was difficult. You know, it says here, you know, the people who would normally not mix, it's not that I'm antisocial, it's that I'm introverted. I, want, I don't want you to know that I have a problem. I want to look good on the outside. I want to fix all the things. I'm okay. I'm going to take care of this. Just leave me alone, right? So you present me with, well, what is the solution? And you, you know, like, what do I have to do? Well, maybe you have to put yourself if you think that you, you know, your way of doing things hasn't worked, well, maybe there's a spiritual solution, however that manifests itself in your life. Maybe there's a spiritual... Wait a minute, what is that about? So, the, the, the obstacle that I had to face was myself. And when it talks about the spiritual experience, and it mentions in the back, you know, on page 567, you know, there's contempt prior to investigation. Well, that was it. I wanted help, but I wanted it under my terms. You're telling me that, well, there's other ways to get clean and sober, but if you want to do it the way that we've done, and we've got a history of success here, perhaps you should look at a spiritual solution once again, you know, like, whoa, slow, you know, pump the brakes a little bit, you know. I had tremendous contempt. I thought I'd burn that bridge. I didn't think that I could even go back to whatever it was, another person, or because I had a religious upbringing, and this isn't about religion. Let me say that again. This is not about religion. This is about a spiritual solution. Well, let me get over this thing that is blocking me. So, how do you do that? Well, it mentions this, this thing here. It says the tragic truth is that, and, I, and I'm looking at page 23 here. After it says, well, here's the problem, and we're gonna offer you a solution, right? On page 23, there's two pages here that it says, Let's rephrase this again. Let's give you something to think about, Eduardo. The tragic truth is that if the man be a real alcoholic, the happy day may not arrive. And by my own living in this program and being around, I have seen people who tried and failed. And I know that it is a miracle that I'm sitting here because the way that I was living and what I was doing, I, I cannot explain why I'm alive today. And because I try to live my best in the day, it's maybe just to be among you people and to thank you because you represent every alcoholic that has been there before. I love sitting here. I have trouble speaking, believe it or not. I get kind of nervous, I get kind of lost. But nevertheless, you represent every alcoholic that has helped me, and I thank you for being here today. I really mean that. So, I lost control, it says, and the tragic situation may have arrived in practically every other alcoholic before it was even suspected. I did not know that I was killing myself on the installment plan, right? And I was without defense against that first drink. 
And then it says at the bottom of page 24, when this sort of thinking is fully established in an individual with alcoholic tendencies, I may not know what the problem was, but I knew that I had alcoholic tendencies. I've probably placed myself beyond, beyond human aid, and unless locked up, I might die or go permanently insane. I've been there. I had a moral death. I had a spiritual death, and I was crazy. And I didn't want you to know that, because I was afraid if you knew what I had done and how I felt and what I thought and where I'd been, you wouldn't like me. And the, the, just as a sidebar, when I came into AA, I wanted to be liked. Who doesn't? But I didn't want to be known. All right? You made it easy for me. I have a book. I have meetings. And I see myself in each and every one of you. In one way or another, I see myself, I feel you, I hear you, and I feel at home among you. It took a while. So an alcoholic who says, I've been there, I know how you feel, and I'm offering you a solution, well, what's left but to pick up those spiritual tools? Get out of your head, Eduardo and try this, what have you got to lose? Well, if I'm feeling spiritually, morally, mentally dead, why not? So, it says on page 25, there's no middle of the road solution. And it took me years to understand what that meant because I used to think that it was like saying, well, if I couldn't get a spiritual solution, I wasn't going to make it, right? But what it's talking about is that if you're in AA, this is what we did. We're giving you the roadmap. This is the solution according to us and according to work for us. We're not going to debate it with you. But where are you along the journey? That's where I got confused because I thought, because I'm, I'm an alcoholic and I live in extremes, you know. It's taken me a while and I'm trying to find, you know, that balance. But it was all or nothing. And here it says that, well, this is the solution. It doesn't mean that while I'm working towards that, while I'm working towards where am I on this journey, if I am somewhere along the way, it doesn't mean that it's not going to work for me. Do you, does that make sense? Right? Okay. So there's no middle of the sort. This is the solution, we're saying. Join us, feel the spirituality among us. Try to experience that in your own life. But don't leave before the miracle happens to you. That's what I heard. We've got your back, Eduardo. And I needed to hear that. When you live a life of isolation, and someone is reaching out their hand and saying, here, take this before you drown, like the ship, right? And it's not about the tragedy. We are not here to judge you. We're here to help you unconditionally. And that's what it talks about. One alcoholic helping another. This turned everything around for me because I did not understand unconditional love and acceptance, non-judgment. I didn't understand that because I was the judgmental you know, conditional kind of person. So, of course, I had resistance to that. But there's no middle-of-the-road solution. You know, you're either going to try it this way and get beyond that contempt, this thing, this mental, it's your mind. The main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than his body. 
And these things that it was talking about is, yeah, we're going to talk about some things that are somewhat controversial, but they were controversial at the time, like the medical view, right? We're going to read later on about Dr. Silkworth, and, you know, like, he understood that his opinion was controversial at the time. We have learned since that there is a thing about the alcoholic's body, the way that we metabolize alcohol that creates a craving for more. We learn that in here, right? We also learn, you know, that the psychiatric aspects of what we're talking about in here, those were controversial. We have made tremendous strides with understanding what obsessive compulsive behavior is about. I obsessed over alcohol when I wasn't drinking. It didn't make me um, a defect. It just meant that I had this thinking, you know, that if I wasn't drinking, I was thinking about it. And I had this thing that shut off all of the stuff that happened. Don't think about the tragedy. Don't think about the shipwreck. Don't think about the iceberg. Don't think about the sinking and the drowning. Maybe this time I'll beat it, right? And I would obsess on that thought, and it nearly killed me. And then the social aspect of this. Well, there's a lot more social acceptability about people, not just alcoholics. We remain anonymous because there's still a lot of ignorance out there. And it is my right it is my privilege to tell another person that I'm an alcoholic. But nevertheless, in general, and I know I'm broad stroking here, there's a little bit more social acceptance to alcoholics and people who are in 12-step recovery and who have problems. There's self-help books, you know, all that stuff. So which is the controversial part here? It remains the spiritual and back then he wrote the religious aspect of the book. But at some point, I had to face that square on and say, okay, where am I? And what am I going to do? Am I going to be willing to make that change? So, the good news that I have to share with you is that I have bridged that gap between reason to faith. It was a quantum leap for me, but it was a soft landing. You know? When I get into my head, when I think that these things are going to be problems, I am creating a problem in my head. And I'm not trying to convince anybody to say, oh, you know, just you know, forget about that stuff, you know. Challenge it, but open up your heart instead of your head. That's what I had to do. And the chapter ends with, yes, I am one of them. I must have this thing too. It's a blessing. This tragedy that happened, I now see it as a gift. But what am I going to do with it? I'm going to thank you for helping me. I'm going to thank you for your attention. I'm going to wish you the best today. And um, I think that's all I want to say. Bye.